One of the best things that anyone can do to support artists is, of course, to buy work from them. But say you're not a millionaire. Say you've always loved art, but never thought of it as something you can own. Where would you even begin? To find out what we, the 99%, can do to start thinking of ourselves as people who could collect art and support the artists that we love, I sat down with my friend Maddie Boucher, a curator, technologist, and the former head of the Art Genome Program at Artsy. Hi, Maddie. Hi, Phil. Thank you for talking with me today. It's my pleasure. One of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you was because um, some time ago you said, and I don't quite remember the context that this was set in, but I remember you saying something like, what, what is needed is a middle-class public to support a middle-class artist. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a, there's a lot in that statement that can be unpacked, so I'd like to take it a little bit, like, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. So to start with, I guess... What are some of the barriers to being or to sustainably being like uh, to sustaining a middle class standard of living as an artist or as a gallerist even? Mm -hmm. I think that um, when you think of the plight of both artists and gallerists at that level, like they're remarkably similar mm -hmm. um, because uh, artists have very much depended on galleries to support them through the early years of their career and help them really find a collector base and make a reputation. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at what galleries are going through, um, it's brick and mortar operating expenses are extremely high, um, especially in cities where there's a large art market like Beijing or um, London or New York, um, it's becoming harder and harder to maintain a brick and mortar presence. More and more of um, art sales are moving to um, events like art fairs, uh, which there's an explosion of. I think there's more than 3,000 art fairs 3, going, on, going on in every year all over the world. But I think that what galleries are struggling with is that even attending these art fairs is extremely expensive. Maintaining a brick and mortar presence is very expensive. Um, more and more are starting to experiment with a um, mostly online and pop-up kind of method of working where um, maybe it's a little bit more like a traditional dealership mm -hmm. um, model where um, galleries will decide to rent out spaces for four to six um, in-person exhibitions a year. In addition to that, they'll do the contemporary art fair circuit mm -hmm. um, and do in-person sales at those fairs. Um, they still maintain a stable of artists who are signed and they represent. Um, they tend to offer work at a more accessible price point and they seem to operate in a more modern way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one model that people are adopting. Um, but you'll hear galleries talk a lot with frustration about the fact that um, <sighs> It's sort of like they're operating as, in to use a music industry analogy, as indie labels in a world where every artist wants a major label deal. Mm -hmm. um, that as soon as someone's career starts to take off, often they'll be poached by one of these big name galleries. Um, and the uh, emerging gallery that really took a gamble on them and invested in them early mm -hmm. in their career um, doesn't get to reap the benefits of that investment. Right. Um, it's becoming very hard to survive as a gallery um, that isn't kind of one of these big international corporations. Um, and so another shift that you've seen is that a lot of the money in the art world is moving out of the primary market and into the secondary market. Really? Yes. Wait, so like mo mo uh, an increasing percentage of sales are secondary sales? Yes, or an increasing and an increasing dollar value uh -huh. of sales is moving out of the primary market and into secondary market sales. Big players like auction houses are um, getting to sort of set prices in a way that trickles down all the way down the market. Mm -hmm. um, so when effectively when um, contemporary art is going up for auction at evening sales at um, prices that for the first time in history actually exceed that of like very well-established artists, um, old masters even, um, what you get is kind of an inflation in the value of contemporary art um, that trickles all the way down the market. And so if a gallery, say, operating in Jakarta, who wants to catapult their artist to mm -hmm. um, international prominence, um, wants to signal that their artists are really serious, mm -hmm. they are going to start to price their art, their artist's work, a little bit closer to um, to what 
a collector in the international contemporary art world would expect to pay for a piece, which Mm -hmm. is then out of step with what maybe their local market can actually afford. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, pricing art is like very little science and it's a whole lot of impressions and smoke and mirrors and galleries think really hard about how to price their artist's work. And it's a little bit about who do I want this artist peer to peers to be. And it's a little bit of what can I actually, you know, what's, what's going to actually get collectors in the door and purchasing and start to establish a collector base for this artist's work. So if for some of these reasons, um, it's difficult to operate uh, a gallery um, focusing on emerging artists. Yes. Why do they compete for that same clientele with like the David Swerners of the world? What's the, why don't they just try to find another market for those, for their artists? Yeah, it's a very good question. Basically, like, why is everyone in the art world from the people at the tippy tippy top to the galleries on the very bottom, mm-hmm. all competing over the same pool of collectors? Right. Like economically, you should be able to say, why don't you just go after a different group of collectors? Right. It's what any other industry would do, find another market. Exactly. Um, I think the problem is we don't have that other base of collectors Mm -hmm. in the contemporary art world right now. And that gets to your point that what we need is a middle-class public to support a middle-class artist. Yeah. What would it mean to create a middle-class art-consuming public? In many ways, that's the hardest part of this Mm -hmm. whole, you know, constellation of issues to solve. Mm -hmm. The international contemporary art world um, is a very elite and very closed place. Mm -hmm. Um, Even people who are extremely well off and could afford to start collecting art feel alienated enough that they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, That is not even to start talking about all the people who feel that collecting art is financially out of reach to them, which is the vast majority of us. Yeah. And I think the first thing to say is that even though that international art world seems like the 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 sort of North Star, the goal um, yeah. that defines, you know, what's important in the art world right now, the art world is so much bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are tons of galleries that um, are just happy to talk to anyone who walks in the front door. The kind of general estimate that many art lovers have that art is something that they love but can never really own Mm -hmm. is that general estimate accurate i actually don't think that's true um i think that uh many people make one or two purchases a year that cost upwards of a couple hundred dollars whether that be on a new gadget or um maybe on a, a fancy accessory um you know i think that average people aspire to and do sometimes spend a lot of money on say luxury fashion Mm -hmm. that indicates to me that there is a lot of really awesome art out there and artists who um, are very uh, would be very grateful for the support whose work costs no more Mm -hmm. than that Um, you know prints are a really excellent way to start collecting art Mm -hmm. Um, prints by emerging artists are almost always priced under five hundred dollars um for even established artists you can buy a print for under a thousand dollars um and that is a beautiful original work of art Mm -hmm. um that was made with a lot of love and care and attention um, and possibly with attention to some of the issues that you care about because maybe you live in the same community with the person that made it. Yeah, absolutely. Artists' open studios are also a great place to make contacts. And if that artist is not represented by a gallery, it's very possible to inquire with the artist if you can buy work from them. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that if that's something you're interested in doing, there's like a couple things to be aware of. The, the first is that um, galleries are really important to supporting artists. And if a gallery, if an artist is gallery represented, it's important to respect their wish to go through the gallery to purchase the work. Um, that's a very, uh, galleries support artists early on in their career. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to maintain um, the financial stability that makes that possible. Um, and another thing to be aware of is that Um, as with my own work, I've actually had people approach me, um, and saying like, I love your stuff. Can I commission something from you or can I buy something? 
And then being really alarmed when I give a price point, like say $900 for a large painting, Mm -hmm. um, and sort of saying like, Oh, but like, that's too much for me. Can't you come down a little like, Hey, there's absolutely no shame in saying that's a price point I can't afford. Right. But understand that when an artist is giving you a price, they're often thinking about the very least that they can charge Mm -hmm. for not just the, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of hours that go into making a work, but also the thousands and thousands of hours that they've put into their education and their practice. Right. What if I understand that and like, nevertheless, like you said, that's a price point I can't afford. Right. Like, I mean, I think then you can ask like, do you, do you ever make, like, keep me informed when, if you ever do like a print series or something mm-hmm. like that? Um, or maybe that that's just one thing that's not going to work out. Like part of the joy of, um, starting to collect art is the the hunt, the pursuit. Right. Um, it's not going to be as easy as finding the thing you want, to, finding the pair of jeans you want and buying them online. Like is yeah. it, but that's part of the joy of it mm-hmm. is that you're going to have to look around and there's going to be a lot of stops and starts and you're going to learn some interesting things along the way. Mm-hmm. Is there print work or other types of artwork available under a hundred bucks for like, um, if you're really like, you know, a student or something like that? Yeah, certainly. Um, if you walk into your local community print shop, um, there are print shops in most major American cities and many smaller towns as well. Um, you'll find a lot of local artists who are making screen prints or um, kind of poster adjacent work. Mm -hmm. And that's all very affordable and handmade. Um, You know, a lot of street art comes at a very accessible price point. I would rather have somebody spend money on street art than spend the equivalent amount on a a framed poster reproduction of a Jackson Pollock or Mm -hmm. something like that. Mm Right, because a lot of people do spend a lot of money on posters, actually. Absolutely. Everybody decorates their apartment or their home in some fashion or another, and frames alone frequently cost several hundreds of dollars. Um, yeah. You could totally buy, like, real good work for that. Where would you start? Would you start by, like, going on a gallery walk? Would you start by... Where, totally. What would you do? I mean, I think that the the best way to get into art is to um, to learn about it through storytelling in some way, shape, or form. There's a lot of great gallery walks and tours where somebody's going to take you through and tell you about um, tell you about the mm-hmm. district, tell you about the work that you're seeing, um, and you know you'll often find that if you walk into a gallery that somebody there is going to be willing to talk to you a bit about the, what the artist was thinking and mm-hmm. their purpose and their process um, behind it. Um, you know, I think that like storytelling is one of the most compelling ways to start to connect with art. Mm -hmm. Um, what about like, you know, I live in a medium to large size city. There's a gallery district in my city that I know of Mm -hmm. that sell, that aims particularly at that international art market that I know I can't afford, but I'm pretty confident that there are artists living here that, um, maybe, are less known or are less um, supported by that market, which Mm -hmm. I might like to purchase some work from and who would be happy for my support? How would I go about finding them? Um, It's a good question. I bet. I I think that many of those places, artists will organize open studios. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes in a neighborhood, all the artists will decide to get together and do an open studio at the same time um, so that you can walk around and actually peep inside the studio, talk to the artists themselves about what they've made, Mm -hmm. um, and start to sort of get get a feel for what's going on in your town. Yeah. I I think too, that, you know, going, going to places where you couldn't possibly afford something is also an important part of the process of Mm -hmm. getting to understand, uh, what's out there and, uh, and what your taste is. Mm -hmm. So it's not all just kind of a, a drive to, to figure out how to buy things. It's also, it's also finding the enjoyment and just seeing art. Mm-hmm. You and I have been in the art world for, or adjacent to the art world for a long time, mm-hmm. right? There are certain like signs that we read when we look at a gallery or yes. look at a person's work or like, and we see that like this person or this gallery, for example, uh, trades in tourist kitsch. We don't want that. Mm-hmm. This gallery is like, you know, maybe trying to position itself to like for the international art scene, but maybe has more aspiration than it has like, you know, brains. Um, or this gallery here is something that no one really pays attention to, but they're really passionate and they churn out 
fantastic work. Yeah. These are seen, these are signs that you and I can read or um, someone that's been in and around art for a long time can read, especially not even art specifically, but like the art world, right? Yeah. That institution or set of institutions. But a person who just simply loves art and wants to maybe start collecting it might not be able to read those signs and, you know, understandably is worried about being taken for a ride, you know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think that in those situations, it's less likely that you're going to be taken for a ride. Um, it's, it's more likely that you'll walk into one space and find that there's nothing that you can afford mm -hmm. and then leave and then find the space where you're like, Oh, I actually like this work and there's something you can afford. Like it, to some extent, there's no wrong answers. It's just what you like is what you like. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most intimidating things for people who are just starting to collect art, um, no matter where they are in terms of financial ability to pay mm -hmm. is, uh, what is all the unspoken etiquette right. that goes into, um, buying art. Right. Um, I would argue that this unspoken etiquette is itself a product of the fact that the art market has been extremely elite and only getting more so. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's sort of an aside. There are some things that you can do to sort of start getting past that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're already in a turning point in the art world where, um, galleries with, with like more of a shift towards online sales, Galleries expect to be more transparent about pricing. Mm -hmm. um, 15 years ago, you couldn't walk into a gallery and expect there to be a price posted on the wall or even a price list necessarily. Mm -hmm. But today, I, there's almost nowhere that doesn't at least have a price list that you can ask to look at. Yeah, I've seen them at Sverner. Like, yeah. 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 And that was like unheard of yeah. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, they would never publicly disclose their pricing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, is smaller galleries especially are very open to answering questions about things like how does shipping work? How does insurance work? Mm -hmm. um, is there an option to frame things? Do you have a framer that you prefer? Um, I think that they're very open to answering those sorts of, of questions mm -hmm. and people shouldn't feel, you know, don't feel ashamed or squeamish about asking because, you know, there's no way that you can know this stuff before you ask. What are those questions? You mentioned shipping. Shipping, yes. Um, framing. Shipping and framing is a big one. Shipping and handling is a weird one because um, often, even though you might be at a gallery where the thing you're looking at is portable and you could put it in a cab and get home in 30 minutes, I they will not let you do that. I have this experience, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and part of that is um, is because of insurance. Mm -hmm. There, you know, many galleries have insurance policies that say that art has to always be transported by like an mm -hmm. art handler. Mm -hmm. So as much as you could be, and, and some of these things are just like flat out inefficient in the art market, and there are a lot of players in the art market who are trying to change it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, until they do, some things like that are going to be weird and annoying and counterintuitive. And I've seen situations where the shipping costs exceeded the price of the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be one where the only thing you can do is give the gallery feedback that that is just a non-starter. And, mm -hmm. you, just you know, <laughs> you just lost the sale. Yeah. Like, that's how things change. Yeah. Um, well, it happened to me once, uh, just like a couple of years ago, and I yeah. won't name the gallery, but uh, you can come visit it if you want to, or you could go visit it if you wanted to. It's here in New York. I walked into this gallery and purchased a print, mm -hmm. and I was like on my way to somewhere else. I said, do you have like a way that I can take this with me that won't damage it? And uh, they like looked at me kind of like, yeah, no, we don't really. Um, okay. Can you ship it to me? They weren't set up to do that either. It's like, oh my god! I ended up like they didn't even have a way to take my money. Like I ended up having to uh, wow. like find the gallerist on Venmo. Oh my god! Send them money and hope that they sent me the print in the mail, and they never did. Like, yeah. So like, so the art world is full of sketchy crap like this. Well, I don't think it was sketchy. I think they just weren't set up for success. They weren't expecting to sell anything. And how I think can like you operate a business and not think about how can we take money and give people the thing that we're selling. Yeah, I guess like there like. were some channels that um, they were accustomed to using that my situation, common as it would seem to be, didn't fall under. And I think that might be something that galleries could do better. It's like if you want to sell art. Be prepared to sell art. <laughs> right. Well, and I've even seen like being on the 
side of this, you know, when I was working at Artsy, one of the things that I worked on was figuring out um, how we were going to introduce like a direct e-commerce option on our website, Mm -hmm. Um, which you'd be amazed how, um, you know, (laughs) unexpected in the art world, the idea was of somebody being able to make a direct purchase online. And I thought that was Artsy's whole jam. Uh, no, so Artsy had always been set up in order to connect collectors and gallerists, but it was sort of up to them in conversation mm. on the platform to figure out how, how to complete the transaction. Uh-huh. Exactly. Um, and, you know, that's partially because uh, gallerists still oper- in a, operate in a world of wire, wire transfers and checks. Mm-hmm. You know, one, of, one of the problems that we were trying to solve was um, how to get gallerists to accept credit cards mm-hmm. essentially as a form of payment um, or debit cards if that's what the uh, purchaser would like to use. Um, very difficult. A lot of gallerists didn't have um, point of sale systems set up. Um, although, you know, a lot of a lot of them are starting to change and come around and realize that like, oh yeah, this is an essential part of doing business. Companies like Square and Level and whatever make this a lot easier to set up a point of sale for yourself. Um, so part of this is just biding your time. Undoubtedly, the industry will go in that direction. Anyway. Yeah, definitely the industry is moving in this direction. Um, and uh, and better alternatives are kind of being built right now as we speak um, to, to effectively modernize this industry that's been very slow to adopt new technology. Mm-hmm. Of course, buying art is not the only way to support it. There are many other things that you, as an average person, can do to support visual artists, writers, musicians, independent filmmakers, etc. And that's what I'd like to get into next time.